I'm very pleased to have with me today uh, Anish Mohammed from our uh, security practice. So he's a, one of our top consulting guys in, in, uh, in security. Uh, he's got over 12 years experience uh, dealing with security issues in IT. He's a member of the, uh, the Cloud Security Alliance working group and is also a member of the ISO Standards Committee. So hopefully we'll be able to answer a number of questions that you have around security, where the standards are going, um, and how we're approaching some of the issues in the industry. Before I hand over to Anish, I just wanted to sort of set the scene. Um, when you're thinking about security, I think it's worth just standing back for a second and thinking about your current IT setup. You know, if you look at the way IT is delivered typically today in many organizations, you know, there are some drawbacks with it. Um, you'll have heard all through today about the, the costs, uh, the capital intensivity of the, uh, the way we do things, the high maintenance and run costs, which means you spend so much of your IT budget on keeping the stuff going and not able to invest on the things you want to drive the business forward with. Um, and also, the current way we do IT has a load of security issues with it. So when we start sort of saying, you know, well, what about cloud? It's got all, you know, what about the security around cloud? I think it's important that you do that within the context of the problems we, we have with today's. Um, and indeed, in talking with a number of our clients, especially with some of the business people, they see security as a problem with the way we do IT today, and they actually see cloud as potentially a way to outsource that problem to somebody else. Now, they don't, they don't quite know how, they don't quite know, you know where, where that's going to happen or how it's going to happen, but the business is starting to think, you know, I have problems with security. My current IT folk don't seem to be able to handle that problem. Maybe cloud is a way to give that problem to somebody else who can maybe do it more professionally. Okay, so that's something maybe we want to talk about this afternoon as we go through the discussion. Maybe something we can talk to Anish about. But the future under cloud computing, you know, does appear very attractive to, to many business people. You know, you pay by the drink, capital light, lower maintenance and run costs, you know, typically 40% plus we're seeing. You know, manage security if it's done right, and again, we'll talk about that. Um, potentially business leading, able to do things very quickly with a lot of agility. All those things are very attractive to business. You know, and becoming a cloud-enabled business is something we're seeing many of our clients now saying, yep, that's what I want to do, that's what I want to get to. Okay, how do I go about doing that? In order to sort of test this hypothesis, we did some work with the London School of Economics to ask... Uh, both business people and IT executives uh, in many, many different organizations, small, medium, and large, what their thoughts were about some of the topics around cloud computing. Okay, you won't be able to read the details here, so I'll highlight some of the, the key findings. But the most important thing that came out of it was there's, a, there's just a huge gap between what the business people are thinking and what the IT people are thinking. Okay, and we're seeing that with, with some of our clients. Um, you know, we have a, uh, a very large oil company at the moment, um, big client of ours. The IT department found out that the businesses were going out buying cloud services in huge quantity without going through the IT department, and without even, even informing them. And so they pulled together those business people and said, okay, well, what's going on? And the feedback they got were, um, look, we're trying to set up new oil wells in conjunction with a number of our collaboration partners we need to get things up and running quickly, you know, within a matter of a week or two. We come to you and say, look, we need a website set up where we can share data. And you're telling us it's 12 weeks to get a development server. You know, you're becoming irrelevant to us. You're too slow. We don't know how much you cost. We don't even know what services you offer. We can go and get you know, reasonably good services out on the internet through cloud. You know, if you don't get your act together soon, you're going to become irrelevant. And that CIO, very big company, this, took it on the chin and we're now working with him to figure out how can he transform his IT function to offer a level of service which is more comparable with some of the services that are now out you know, on the market. So we're now working through that with them. Um, so that, I think, just gives you an example of where the business and IT you know, have this gap. So some of the things that were highlighted in our survey with the London School of Economics were uh, that... The business sees cloud very much as something that's going to be critical to driving the adoption of new technology quickly, um, the ability to get hold of new uh, applications very quickly, being able to transform the business using IT much more quickly than they have been in the past, and also provide much more secure IT. 
So going back to the point I made earlier, the business actually sees cloud as a way to bring more security. And that's very different than the message that was coming from our IT uh, sample from the, the, uh, the research who was saying, no, you know, security is a problem in the cloud. Okay, so I just wanted to set that context. You know, our view is that cloud can provide uh, a very secure environment if it's done in the right way. And so I'm now going to hand over to Anna. She's going to talk about how we're recommending that to some of our clients. And we'll also illustrate with some client examples we're working on at the moment. Thank you very much, Andrew. Before I start, I probably should uh, mention this. If anyone feels like interrupting me, please uh, put your hand up and interrupt me. So Andrew has already explained what we found with our clients. We found two different sets of messages. A set of message that's been provided by the IT, who think who own the place, who could control the space, and a bunch of people who actually pay them to do what they want to do. Uh, you know, they're consumers who have a very different view of the whole set of things. And uh, as you can imagine, the IT executives are kind of a bit concerned about cloud computing. Because there are a few challenges that they haven't seen before, right? So one of them is, if you look at a so-called SLA from say AWS, I mean Amazon Web Services, or other people that are around, is it says best effort, okay? And best effort always seems like a slippery slope to many in IT. So they think, oh, this is not good enough. And if you look very carefully at the SLAs that they have, you know, the cloud providers normally have, you know, infrastructure as a service, or platform as a service, or the software as a service, you find it really, really hard, except with exceptions. I, I, I'll say that there are exceptions to this, and exceptions don't make the rules so here. I'll go with the generic trend, which is essentially you won't find the level of SLAs that can match the traditional IT, a classic one. Imagine the four nines, right? If you go five nines, there's nobody around in the cloudy world that will actually provide you that level of assurance, available assurance. So I already, you know, talked about it. So weak service agreement, availability, <coughs> classic thing, uh, uptime, performance, throughput, and confidentiality. There are changes to it. There are, again, exceptions to the whole thing. And we have seen this while working with our clients as well. You know, they are flexible. If you're large enough, and you have the ability to provide them with economies of scale, they are willing to move. The real economies of scale are actually gained by having a standard delivery mechanism and standards to everything. So in this case, you know, say for example, uh, there's a well-known case of Google, right? If you go talk to Google, is there anyone from Google in this room? Yeah, okay, thank God, it's <laughs> fine. Uh, <laughs> Uh, they actually managed to have a different set of agreement with uh, LA, LA County Council, uh, whatever that's called. Uh, they allowed them to have a localization. Effectively, what that means is they will have the data based in the US, and they said, okay, we agreed to actually back things up, which normally they don't do. So there's one more very key thing that uh, normally IT uh, people tend to recognize. I'm, I'm sure business people will recognize as well. This is the fact that the penalties versus the cost involved are not on the same scale. Say for example, you are using a software as a service provider. You pay them 10 quid to offer you office services, i.e. office applications on the cloud. If it goes down for an hour, even though you paid just 10 quid, your loss could be hundreds of thousands or your millions. So that is a huge shift from normal. Normally, if you have a service that's worth like a million, you pay them a million or you know, something small. There'll be a delta, that's your revenue. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm trying to you know, go through the whole process and try to explain why is it that actually people think cloud is really different? Why is it that people think it's really different from outsourcing? And we are pretty much all you know, very comfortable with outsourcing things. So on the left, oh, no, sorry, left or right, whichever. It's the, Outsource one on the other side is the extreme of cloud computing, which is the public cloud. So when you have an outsourced situation, you know, you know where the server is, you know who accesses it, and you, you know what the uptime is, you know if the auditors can go and see it. And uh, normally, if the security team has a you know, good relationship with the outsourcer, you'd be they will be happy, you'd be happy. 
Now here comes the cloud. You don't know who controls it. You don't know where your data is. You don't know who stores it, when it's backed up, who can access it, how resilient it is. You know, you have this incidents in Amazon Web Services. So, you know, can, can your auditors go in and see any of this? Uh, most likely, no. So this is kind of a new territory for you. So you have some concerns there. So you see a perceived, and this, again, this is very important, it's a perceived loss of control. You always, like uh, humans in that general, are keen to control things. They, you, know, you, you want to control whatever you own, you, you know, your data is no different from anything else. And similarly, your machines as well. I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that though, but you know, that's the case. So you think you have lost something. What have you lost is a question. Now the next thing is organizations are still learning. We are just in, in a phase where we are you know, starting to use, or a large number of our clients are starting to use cloud as a service. And again, under the challenges, there are no real standards. Can I go to a service provider and say to them, I want a, a cloud service that actually, you know, fits to X, Y, Z standard, so I can take it across from one service provider who complies to the standard to another one who complies to the standard and it'll all work fine. No, so far, it's a challenge. It's, it's happening, but it's a challenge. Again, the other one is, you know, how to interpret regulations. And those of you who were there in the previous session where there was this <coughs> question about Patriot Act and how it's going to impact us, again, classic case. You know, we don't know how things are going to happen unless and until it happens, we don't know how to, you know, interpret laws and things like that. Okay, so end result, cloud, you know, security in the cloud is perceived slightly differently from what that used to be in outsourcing. And for, oh, you know, for most things which are mission critical, you'll find that public clouds are normally not used. And we, what we see in the client side is they use application as an application as a service and software as a service uh, to a large degree. And uh, there is a huge preference for private cloud and there are some instances of hybrid cloud. Okay, so this is how I would say, you know, clouds could be classified, uh, cloud workloads could be classified. So one axis is the business risk and the other axis is for need for assurance. It's, it's for regulatory kind of stuff. So some things are really easy. So say for example, development and testing, right? That is in low hanging fruit. You could definitely take it to the cloud. The security implication of doing that is minimal. You know, on the other end of things, if you want to do say mission critical workloads or things like that, probably people would really think about it. And you know, we haven't reached a stage where we have enough of data points to say I can provide you 99.999 assurance to do X, Y, Z over this many years of time. The cloud has been only around for like three plus years. 97, uh, 2007 is, yeah, four years, sorry. Yeah, 2007 is when they started selling things out. They didn't have an SLA then, AWS that is. Now lots of people have SLAs, and that's a good improvement. And that's, the rate of progress is huge, so you know, in next year or two, you, this scenario might change. Okay. You've already seen this thing on the top right corner. It's, you know, the difference in perception between business and how IT, and I would say security or risk-based approach. Business really wants agility. They want flexibility, and th those are the real drivers. So if you can bring down your cost, you know, you can gain competitive advantage. You really want to go for it. And if there is a market entrant who is a player in your space who already is using that, the client has not much of a choice. You have to use the cloud, right? And then you have the bunch of guys who are in the older traditional world because the security guys and all the rest of the guys are still there. They're just moving in. They see concerns. I mean, it's understandable. And then there's this question of lack of maturity. This exactly goes back to this challenge that we had in the previous session. It's like in some laws come in, some regulations come in. How do we manage it? Do we know what this means? It's a you know unknown thing. Humans, by nature, fear unknowns. Uh, we, we don't you know, go and embrace unknowns. We just wait for things to happen. And it's always better to have a known better than an unknown. All right, okay. So I think one of the key things for anyone to actually get onto the cloud is to have a clear strategy to manage this, this duality. One side where business really wants to go to stuff, and the other side where you know, a risk-based approach tells you, you know, you want to be a bit careful. So we have a, a generic approach, which we tend to normally 
use at our client side. Probably, you know, I have like three or four data points that, that have been involved personally. So most of the stuff that I mentioned here are from those data points. So if you have questions, put your hand up and I'll try to answer them. So this is how we see it. First, uh, these are not, you know, anything rocket science. These are fairly obvious ones. You know, know your appetite for risk and, you know, and for privacy, right? And second is to expect, uh, expect anybody who's actually offering anything, share the responsibility. Demand transparency. This normally is, I would say, true of all human interactions. You could probably say this to anyone who's even a friend of yours or you, you are having a business relationship with. These are things that are there in a normal human world that we use on a day to day. So you want somebody who's actually you know, working with you, tell, tell you like, you know, uh, this is what we tend to do and this is how we do it. And you probably ask pointed questions to get that answers. All, all this being said, it's like, you know, we just want to make sure that happens here. And use cloud to solve identity and access management issues. This is a bit controversial, but it really works. Uh, I have data points for a broadcaster. I have a data point for a retailer, which where this has really worked for them. I have to say there are two sets of drivers for them. One is a BYOD, bring your own device. You know, most of the guys in the room, I'm sure have I, I, iPhones and iPads. So when you have that, all the applications normally reside in the cloud that forces the business to you know, go into the cloud because the users are already in the cloud. And again, this is a point that somebody in a previous session, I can't remember his name, sorry, I'm pretty bad with names. He mentioned it. He mentioned that you have to actually architect your solutions to address the risk. So, you know, it's normal stuff. What I'm saying is knowing your appetite so effectively, what this means is like most, uh, most businesses, when uh, a cloud initiative gets kicked off, it's either kicked off from the infrastructure side of things or from the top, it's the governance, you know, the, 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 C, the CXO, CIO, whatever you mean. If it actually starts from that level, you definitely get the advantage of knowing exactly what your risk appetite is. You know, how many million are you, worth, I mean, are, are you willing to actually pay up for if things go south, let's put it that way, right? And then there's this question of, you know, classifying your data. I mean, it's, it's, it's part, and, you know, part and parcel of uh, looking at things carefully before you jump in. So you want to look at your application landscape, understand what you call, you know, how important is this for your business? Would, you, would I actually risk this for testing something? That, 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 that's a key question. It's a simple, fairly logical, pragmatic thing. You know, consider data location issues. Again, you know, I'm coming back to all the conversations you guys had previously. You know, the cloud computing risk management framework is essentially kind of rationalizing all the stuff that I said just before. Okay, sharing responsibility. The key thing for you is the diagram in the bottom, like infrastructure as a service, Platform as a service, software as a service. And I probably want to warn you, the term consumer and provider, it's always uh, confusing. You can have in a use case or in a scenario, somebody who's actually a provider, who's actually a consumer. I'll give you an example. Imagine you have a SaaS, right? A SaaS provider who's actually using a pass. So he or she is actually a provider at the same time and a consumer at the same time as well. So as you move across, you, know, you can see the amount of compliance burden moving across the supplier or whichever way you're going. So you really want to understand how much risk you want to take. Everything comes, you know, nothing comes free. There's no such thing as a free lunch. So if you want to offset your risk, there is going to be a cost associated with that. You need to understand exactly what that cost is. That's all about risk management and that's all about security. All right, so demand, transparency, and accountability from cloud providers. Again, no brainer. If you pay somebody to do something for you, you really want to know what they do. You want uh, them to be accountable. We have, you know, some things, you know, some, how can I say, some set of questions and uh, some methodology that we have developed to help you guys understand it slightly better. So, you know, we do that. We ask our clients to, you know, 
uh, go through a process of understanding what service you're going to consume, what kind of questions you want to ask, is there something specific, you know, depending on the uh, scenario that involved in, they want to raise, understand what implications you know, that might bring in. Okay, this is an interesting one. This is using the cloud to solve your identity and access issues. And most people would find this to be an oxymoron. I tell you why. I mean, can all the people who actually use Facebook put your hands up, please? Oh, that's pretty good. That's more than 50%. See, you all have an identity in the cloud. If you have the ability to actually reuse that identity to do things, I mean, there might be various ways around it. There you go. You, you, know, you don't have to enroll anyone. Anybody who walks in, the new generation especially, they already have an identity. This, to a great degree, verified identity. I mean, it's, it, it's, how could I say, a debatable question. But, you know, as I'm sure you understand where I come from. There are identities that exist, and cloud is one of the things that's actually enabling you to do a lot of identity and access management. And uh, there are a few things that, you know, you probably would find interesting, which is, you know, IDAS, Identity Management as a Service. I mean, there are people who are already players in the market. You can, you know, say for example, buy such a service. Not many of them are large players, that's one thing. Uh, and the place is evolving. It's like, you know, Identity Management as a Service, IDAS is, is really evolving. There are standards coming up, provisioning, all those things are evolving. So maybe six months from now, what do I say right now about Identity and Access Management? Might be irrelevant. Uh, Anish, can I just ask, ask a question? Sure. One of the things I think we're starting to see clients having to grapple with already is if they are using, I don't know, six, seven, eight, nine different cloud providers to provide services, some software, some platform, some infrastructure, and each of those requires a different sort of sign-on and different way to get into it, it very quickly becomes a bureaucratic nightmare yeah. to manage all those sign-ons, to manage people leaving the firm, joining the firm, giving them access. And so having something like this to, to simplify and help, to help you to manage that bureaucracy yeah, yeah. is going to be critical, I think, yeah. or you're going to get into a real mess. Absolutely. I mean, what Andrew is highlighting there is the provisioning challenges that we have. If you have a typical organization, one of the things that IT tend to do is like, oh, if you go into an IT and you are doing some audit, you would find a lot of people who no longer exist in the organization still having accounts. And you know, that applies almost everywhere. So the thing that you know, provisioning globally would allow you to do is like when you move across, provisioning would make sure that you know, the applications to which the person had access to will disappear. And you know, when a new person comes in, you know, he or she would get the right kind of access to the right kind of things. It'll actually save you a lot of trouble in terms of audit and compliance, and it'll make you, uh, you know, make, make your life easier. And the amount of money you spend in supporting them. Say, for example, each password reset that you have for a user in your enterprise is costing you X, right? If you have like 10 set of application, you, you probably are looking at 10 into X, right? So if you have a collaboration with uh, three different enterprises that actually offer services on the cloud, multiply that again. So you want something that will actually allow you to do federation in that sense, do provisioning in a, in a global perspective. It could be a brokering service of sorts. It's like, you know, you register with somebody who is, I don't know, you know, put up a name and they would actually manage all this for you. You just pay them a small amount of money. That's it. All right, so what do I see what I've seen so far? There's a shift in focus of the security organization. Previously, with security organization, which is a traditional security organization, it's like they were more interested in design and delivery. So it's like for every threat, they would look at what can I actually use to uh, use as a countermeasure. So for a threat, you want a countermeasure. And I want to design, I want to deploy. So that was the focus. So what is happening in, in a cloudy world is slightly different. You don't have the ability to, I mean, you normally don't want to, but in general, you don't have the ability to actually build those and deploy those. What you have the ability is to actually monitor it, put some governance framework around it, and have a strategy as well to do those things. So that's the direction in which it's going. Right, there you go. That's the tagline.
So there's a shift in focus. Previously, you built, it's essentially moving up the, uh, in, a, in a value chain, if you were to look at it. So you go from manufacturing to service. So that's where we are. So uh, what would be my takeaways? Security in the cloud is a fast moving target. There are a whole bunch of services that are currently available. Some would pretty much fit your bill, some might not, but this again is changing. Six months from now, you know, you might find yeah, you know, services that are allowing you to do highly critical things on the cloud. Yep, there are some challenges in security that we don't have current solutions that will give you a very good countermeasure. There are new technologies that's coming up. You might find that will change the scenario. And of course, the thing I was mentioning, there's a shift from designing and execution to managing and governance. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions? Wow, no questions. I'm surprised. Okay, sure. Uh, I have to admit, I'll, I'll put my hand up and I'll say I am part of at least two bodies that's involved in building those things. And I thought if I say that, I'll be more, more or less playing to myself. So. <laughs> All right, I'm on the ISO thing, I'm the CSA ones. Uh, so there, 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 there are quite a few industry standards that are uh, you know, existing in verticals and some general regulatory ones. Say for example, if you're in financial services, you, you can actually think about the PCI ones, right? If you're in uh, generic security, what you tend to ha see is the 27,001. Say for example, you, if you are in the government sector, you, you have IS, you know, IS1, which essentially translates to various impact levels and things of that sort. And then, you know, there, there's a s strong sense in the cloud community that we need to come up with some standards that will allow you to give a level of assurance to the end user and uh, ISO actually is trying to, they have a working group that's actually working on it as a group, uh, ISO group 27. So you know, give it like six months to 12 months, you should have a draft somewhere out which will actually tell you what it is. NIST does have some guidelines. I think the easiest thing for anyone who is actually new to the cloud is, I know it's a bit vague and uh, you know, there's a lot of fuzziness and cloud has been all things to all people. So if you talk to a vendor, a vendor will say, you would do anything, so, and that's a cloud. So, that's my take. Sorry, did I answer your question? Yeah, no, I, mean, I think it's like you're saying, it's, um, it's an emerging, it happens, it, it'll happen quite quickly. Yeah. I think the, 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 absolutely. In yeah. year to 18 months, yeah. we'll start to see absolutely. Um, a, a predictable system absolutely. That, that governments can use. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. yeah I, th I think yeah, you know, I echo that exactly. Yeah, we are seeing very different sets of contracts from different cloud providers. Some are unwilling to sign up to very much at all. <laughs> Others are prepared to sign up to, to the same sorts of contracts you would be used to from a standard hosting outsourcing provider. And so depending on you know, what you're looking for, how much you're prepared to pay, um, what your attitude to risk is for that particular application or that particular data, you know, will guide you to sort of one or the, one or the other. And that, there's a whole spectrum of different sorts of services coming out. And so I think you know, it's having a strategy, 
having a good understanding of your own data and your attitude to risk, you know, as Anish said, and then matching that with what cloud providers are offering you. Um, so I think there are services now out there that, that will probably be able to do what you want to do, um, but some of them may cost more than others depending on your attitude to risk and, um, and so forth. There's always a trade-off. Uh, you can say a three-way trade-off. It's usability versus security versus cost. So for any system, you, have, you can have a three-axis thing like that. They say, you know, usability. Now, if it's usable, mostly users want usable system. So if you look at Facebook, the biggest thing is not its security, right? The key thing I normally tend to say is like, around 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago, I used to work for a, a payment system. I was a security architect for a payment system. It was from a large telecom provider. You would have never heard about them. The telecom provider is huge, you would recognize them, but their payment system, you would never. Our competitor was PayPal. Compare the security of PayPal to ours, zero and one, right? You know what happens, right? You've heard of PayPal, you haven't heard about us. There you go. So security is not the key. I mean, it's what the user wants. That's a key message. You know, if you have a usability, a usability point where your price is right, I mean, that's the whole thing about the cloud. So that's my takeaway message. I really don't want to you know, hold you guys from the drinks. <laughs> so if you, <laughs> so you know, if, you, if, you, you know, if nobody has any more questions, thank you all very much. Uh, just thank you.